Let's bring it in. Troops, quarantine from home, super show. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, Brad Stolberg and Steve Magnus are here. We're gonna talk to them in a minute, but first, there's Adina Jones, Troops Special Correspondent. And you have quite a lot of interesting things to show us, Adina, you wanna take it away? Uh, yes, thanks for having me again, sans bonnet this week. So there is, uh, I, I prepared this video. There's so much going on on social media right now and really happy that we're talking about hoops and NBA players are sharing their thoughts about what's happening in the world today. So I did my best at making a compilation. It is, it is not um, nothing to be fully representative of what's going on here. And I always welcome people to send me other uh, clips that I may have missed. So first up, we've got Jalen Brown and I'll just let him speak for himself because he's been an amazing young man at this point in time. He's in Atlanta in this. Whatever, it's a peaceful protest. But definitely want to be in a celebrity, being an NBA player, don't exclude me from no conversation at all. First and foremost, I'm a black man and I'm a member of this community and I grew up on this soil. So I want to say that first and foremost, but it's a peaceful protest. We walked it and that's it. Raising awareness. Some of the injustice that we've been seeing is not okay. And as a young person, you gotta you gotta listen to our perspective. Our voices need to be heard. I'm 23 years old, I don't know all the answers, but I feel how everybody else is feeling, for sure. No question. No question. This next clip is actually him in the march. That's Atlanta, right? Of you said yes. Atlanta? Yeah, mm -hmm. where he's from. I remember where we yeah, that's Malcolm Brogdon right there. Mm. With him next to him. Okay, I see. So, yeah, like you said, Malcolm Brogdon next to him in the next clip is Malcolm. I just found that so inspirational. No shade to anyone who's out there, but it it, it doesn't seem like Jalen was here for the cameras. Jalen was here to authentically organize, and he wasn't in front of the march. He was in the middle, and coach, as you know, best leaders leave from behind and let everyone shine, and right. and and was just a voice for them to follow. So, and like we were we talked about before, he drove 15 hours. Uh, to Atlanta and a lot of people are like well he drove to Atlanta to be part of a protest but like he said in the video he's that he's home right like that's home it's the birthplace of civil rights nowhere else better to be in that sense next up uh, we got Malcolm Brogdon I got, I got friends that are in the streets that are out here that haven't made it to this level that are experiencing it that are getting pulled over just discrimination day after day dealing with the same the same bullshit and it's, this is this is systematic. This isn't something where we come and, you know, we don't have to burn down our homes. We don't have to. We built this city. This is the this is the most proudly black city in the world. In the world, man. So like, let's take some pride in that. Let's focus our energy. Let's let's enjoy this together. This is a moment. We have leverage right now. We have a we have a moment in time. People are gonna look back, our kids are gonna look back at this and say, you are a part of that. I got a grandfather that marched next to Dr. King in the 60s. And he was amazing. He would be proud to see us all here. We got to keep pushing forward. Jalen, man, has, has led this charge, man. I'm proud of him. We need more leaders. We, we need more people speaking in the... So, Malcolm, that was actually Lil Yachty next to him, too, musician. I'm sure everyone's very, very familiar with him. But... Um, and one thing he did say, I don't know if any of you have ever lived in Atlanta, and it is the blackest city in the world. Like, I, I lived there for two and a half years, and, you know, I'm, from, I'm born and raised in New York, but when I would come home for holidays, I would, I would be reminded, like, oh, look at that, there's other cultures, because Atlanta, and I missed other cultures when I came home to New York, but Atlanta is the blackest city that I've ever lived in, and... Like I said, there's nowhere better for them to be at this point in time. Next up uh, is Enos Cancer. I can't breathe. 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 
And I mean, y'all know Enos is about that life, right? Oh, <laughs> when it comes to protesting, he, like, right, Henry? I feel like he knows all about it. He knows all about it. Exactly. Like, like, oh, my life, life is on the line? Whatever. That's another, right. another day for me. Let's do it. It's <laughs> another day. Like, this yeah. man is an enemy of the state of his, you know, home country. So being at a protest yelling, I can't breathe or standing up for human rights is, is nothing for him. So I was really happy to see him out there. The uniform is a big deal, though. Yes. Like, <laughs> in the uniform. I'm, part of me is just like, hmm, I wonder what the Celtics were thinking at that point in time. I don't think any part of Ennis was like that, though. I think he's like, yeah, I'm wearing this. We'll figure it out later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's actually interesting, too. And a friend of mine was saying, you'll see a lot of people out there. I mean, you got players out there, so that's point blank, period. But I, I've seen this one clip of three Black men three different generations all talking. I know what and, you're talking about. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And one of them is wearing a Greek freak shirt. And I've seen other people, you know, wearing paraphernalia that represents the teams and just how, how integrated sports is into our everyday lexicon. It's like, you guys are here. You're actually in the protest, whether you want to be, be or not, because people are wearing your stuff. Um, next True. up is Marcus Smart. And this is in Boston. We stand for the truth, we stand for justice, and, and we'll stop until we get justice, and that's really what this is about. And, uh, you know, I just want to say to everyone who thinks this is something more than it is, it's not. You know, it's white color gender. The truth is the truth, justice is justice, and justice hasn't been served, and people are pissed off about it. So we're here to, to, to keep, you know, George Floyd's name alive and keep it going and his legacy, and, uh, you know, something has to change for it. Um... Yeah, Marcus. And actually, I was looking at a shirt, despite, it said despite race or gender. And he also said that in his speech. And I was just like, oh, possibly something that he's, I got to go on his Instagram and see if he's like selling it for charity. But obviously, it's a phrase I think we should all embrace at this point in time. Next up is Udonis Haslam. Coach, I know you have a personal connect to him, right? Just, yeah, he was my first ever NBA client. He's just as, a, as authentic a man I've ever met uh, in my life. Yeah, he, he is uh, a very, very special person. David's prone to crying talking about Udonis, even when it's just about like a dinner in a restaurant in Miami. Like, <laughs> something, really, something really special about that young man, for sure. Yeah, Udonis is a, a clip. Like he, he, I think he spoke for about maybe five, six minutes. I shortened it a bit. And one thing I thought was interesting about his clip and I, it resonated with me, is he has members of his family and close family that are police officers and they're police officers right now. And so there is a certain sense of responsibility you feel when you get up and speak and you don't want to condemn the people in your family, but you also uh, want to recognize that there's an institutional problem. And I felt like he did a, he did a good job of that, but it is, and especially as a black person, it's just, it's always something that you're battling with. You know, there are black police officers and they're your family and you know, they're good people. But like Chris Rock said, you know, some professions can't have bad apples, right? Uh, you can't have bad apples in the airline industry and pilots are just crashing into mountains and to say there's, <laughs> there's bad apples. This That's profession right. cannot afford bad apples. And I thought he did a, a good job of balancing that. So I'll let you guys listen. As a black man raising black kids in America, yeah. I'm scared as hell. Way more scared than I ever was for myself. Way more scared than I ever was for myself. Not only black men and black lives, it's the other side of who protects those black men and black lives. Mm -hmm. So now you're saying it's in the community and we got to worry about the people that are supposed to protect us. And I say to everybody, those people were terrible people before they put that badge on. Yes. They was terrible people before they put that badge on, man. For you to stand there and watch that, that ain't got nothing to do with your badge. That has nothing to do with your color. That has nothing to do with your race. That's something inside you that's messed up. Yeah. That's your soul that ain't right. Right, right. So if you can stand there and watch that, I can't say we can blame the whole armed forces and everybody wear a badge. Ain't no way. Because I know at least 50 or 60 of them that I know personally that would have stepped in right then and there. Right. Yeah. And said, nuh-uh. So 
There has to be justice. There has to be protests. We have to be heard. So, yeah, he talked about the 50 or 60 people, and it's a, a tough balance. And I saw him get a little kickback about that because it kind of sounded like not all cops. But I, I felt where he was coming from. But as an institution, the shit is backwards and, and needs to be changed for sure. Next up, I just have a couple of photos. So uh, first of all, also, this is just such a juxtaposition from what we usually do in videos. I mean, I, you know, I know our two guests aren't normally here, but it's normally like, look at this basketball player's roller skate. And I'm, I'm glad we're doing this. So just, just check that moment in my mind real quick. So Pablo Torre got a email. So I don't know if you guys know, but only two NBA teams have not come out and spoken about the current state of the world. And it's the Spurs and the Knicks. And Pablo Torre got a clip a insider email from James Dolan, I mean, sorry, Jim Dolan, uh, to his employees talking about why they're not commenting. And it's, oh, just it's to underscore their position in creating a respectful workplace, says James yes. Dolan. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, because he's the one that creates a respectful workplace. Like when I think of respectful <laughs> workplace, I think of the Dolans, right? Yeah. Um, but the thing that caught me the most was when he said that as companies in the business of sports and entertainment, however, we are not more qualified than anyone else to offer our opinion on social matters. I kind of want to toss that to you guys and see what you thought about that. It reminds me, and I'm going to chime in here, the, the idiots on Twitter that are telling me to stay in my lane because mm. like, I'm supposed to know about performance and well-being. And I'm just like, if this isn't everybody's lane, like this is everybody's lane. There is no more staying in your lane. Like, like if you're not qualified to offer an opinion on this, then you shouldn't be qualified to offer an opinion on anything because this is like, this should be everybody's lane. So I I jumped on that line too. Harvey Weinstein had James Dolan on the board of his company. They were like good friends. He wrote a song about Harvey Weinstein. Like, like, but we're going to stay out of this one. (laughs) (laughs) My thing is, uh, I, I absolutely agree with you. Like, it's everybody's lane. And it also kind of reminds me of the stick to sports, right? Uh, but the fact is, if anyone looks at the history of sports, it's always been a cultural thermometer. And sports have existed to speak about politics. I mean, the Olympics is one big political campaign, right? Uh, so, and if the business of sports and entertainment is all you're interested in, why do we send our teams overseas as goodwill ambassadors and all these things? Uh, we understand the power of sports and thought it was kind of a cop out in that sense. And I, I wonder how, you know, black employees, they feel about that at that time. Let me put that up. The, uh, I, I was going to say one thing, Henry, and then I, I know, I, do you have more, Dean? I don't mean to cut you off. No, I mean, not on Pablo. We got tweets. I got about maybe 10 more. <laughs> oh, go ahead. I don't want to, because I, I want to make sure we, you've got all the time you need. I, okay, I'll, no. I'll mention my thoughts later. All right. Uh, J. Cole and Dennis Smith Jr., they were in North Carolina. And J. Cole, I, a lot of people are here with the, if I don't see you tweeting, your silence is deafening, blah, blah, blah. And honestly, I don't think I've seen J. Cole. He doesn't really tweet that much, but he's always out there. And it just reminded me a lot of white people are texting me like, what can I do? Or I, I'm afraid to say the wrong thing. And the truth is I'm not one of those people where your silence equals violence or it's deafening. Really, if you're out there marching and you just didn't tweet, because I think we all understand that 240 characters can be misconstrued. Um, that's okay, but do something. And I, I feel like this is an example. Next up is uh, we had Jordan Clarkson and J.R. Smith. They were out there. I know J.R. Smith got into some issues with somebody vandalizing his car. <laughs> um, like YOLO, whatever. Someone's destroying your property. This is the time they, they get the business from you. And yeah, he's a big dude. Like these guys, he's, a- he, he's a shooting guard. But in the NBA, those guys are tall and powerful. This is not your little league shooting guard. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Well, also, one thing, when I saw, like, seeing Jordan Clarkson with that mask on, and I think I said this last week, and the way he's standing, like, Jordan Clarkson looks like, I just, I don't even know how to describe it. Like, he could just be if from the neighborhood and chilling, right? Like, 
and the stereotypical he's a he's dangerous he's a thug when in fact like millionaire right and and I, and i think i wanted to to portray that because i think we talked about last time i was on that people always like to say well he's different he's not black he's not a you know he's not one of them but in fact he is and if he changes his clothes does that make a difference to you but he's out here just like everybody else so, do you think they coordinated the masks it's cute though it's a little <laughs> mask. i was like okay i mean and then jr was like nah i'm taking it back with the kente and i feel you hence <laughs> with my cloth today uh next up so WNBA players they spoke out also shout out to made for the w they made these graphics and accumulated these tweets uh riot is the language of the unheard i hope everyone is listening when the smoke clears rebecca brunson uh mystics coach and i pull from this quote all the time i know everyone likes to you know take a martin luther king quote uh, when they want to but truly you know, a lot of folks are saying like, well, you shouldn't be destroying this. You shouldn't be destroying that. Like, don't tell me how to process my emotions when you've had your foot on my neck, your knee on my neck for 400 years. And I tried to, to do it peacefully. I tried to march. I tried to vote. Like, this is what it's going to be. And the fact is, it's not the first time uh, pe people are, are rioting and riots have actually enacted change. And I want people to remember that. Arike, people of color have tried everything under the sun. This is what I was just saying to be seen as equal in this world, literally everything. I don't condone any violence, but truly what else is there to do when you just feel like no one's listening? Um, Jewel Lloyd came out with a statement also. Just, you know, really uh, WMA players to me, I love that they're finding their voice and and being heard in this sense too. Essence Carson, I love how she started it out with, I'm not working out today. I was like, me too, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not working out, but I was like, yeah, this is it, this is it. Um, she's tired when her eyes have witnessed atrocities time and time again. Beautiful black faces have given so much to this world and asked for so little in return to be seen as human, so little. You know, just ask for equal education, just ask for a roof over their head, so little they've asked for. And if uh, Natasha Cloud, this is from her article in uh, the Player Tribune, a letter she wrote, if you're silent, you're part of the problem. And I definitely feel, I feel where she's coming from. I spoke about it earlier, but this quote at the end of her article, I was like, damn. She said, if you're silent, I don't fuck with you, period. Because I'm just out here trying to stay alive and your knee is on my neck. And, you know, I think we think of silent as literal sound but like i said if you're out there with a sign if you're out there donating shit if you want to support a black owned business and buy from another hyphen lane.com mm -hmm. uh, oh i see what you did there <laughs> you are um you're you're using your voice right so silence isn't necessarily always a sound to be made then i think a lot of us saw this the lakers had a unified post if you ain't with us we ain't with y'all and to me this just spoke of some dope black millionaires using their power and using their voice anthony davis lebron and then lastly i thought this this one image of of jalen was just so moving uh, and, um, then lastly we talked about mm. the, uh how the knicks were the only team that one of the two teams that didn't say anything but the spurs were the other team but leave it to popovich to be like fuck that i got this uh, I'm appalled that we have a leader who can't say Black Lives Matter. That's why he hides in the White House basement. There's nothing he can do to make this better because of who he is, a deranged idiot. Uh, interested, because I think one of y'all sent me this, but like, Coach, or anyone interested in what you thought of Pop saying this? <laughs> I mean, yeah, we've said it before. He, he, I, he and Steve Kerr both have done, I, I think, a pretty good job of just staying on message this whole time. There's a reason why most of the players who play for them really, really love them. But there's like a, there's also a huge like, like two coaches can talk about politics, um, and 28 can't. Like they're all obsessed with it. Um, I had a, an NBA head coach show me once. He's like, "You guys think we talk about pick and roll all the time, but look at this." And he shows me his text messages, and it's all like coach to coach about Trump. All of it. That's all they talk about. But 28 owners are like, "We're gonna can your ass if you talk about it." So right. like. That you're obsessed with it and what's so important and meanwhile i'd also point out i don't want to get i do feel like everyone has to find their own way to talk about these things but adam silver hasn't said anything there was a leaked internal memo right. where he and i think it's deep in his heart like there's a whole story um 
about like he grew up with um like he kicked on something out of the league because of real convictions about racism born in his childhood and i think it's really real but i think his feelings don't matter when those are your bosses right um he doesn't right. feel he can take the podium or hasn't so far and that's weird that's a warning sign to me and that greg popovich is doing this and ended with like do you think i haven't got enough trouble yet like greg popovich expects to be not celebrated by his employer for this right um that, that's weird that's that's yeah. worrisome to me yeah uh lebron also you know why doesn't america love us too just it just says it all and you know who gets to arrest the pro the officers acting out during the protest tobias harris like yeah it's um they're policing themselves at this point in time and they're not being arrested i think the la police commissioner just came out and said that the blood of and i don't want to say it was the commissioner i'm sure somebody in the chat will correct me uh but the blood of george floyd's hand is on the protesters like how why oh, yeah, wow. <laughs> why how, the, how? The, yeah the the woman the president of, i think it was the, the attorney for the union out there tweeted shoot the protesters yeah she, they, her account's been removed but she tweeted that come on now yeah Trey Young out here at Black Lives Matter. He was in Oklahoma doing this. And then lastly, this to me, this this spoke, this was Miles Turner spoke um, a thousand words. It's similar to what LeBron James was saying. Why don't they love us too? Like love black people like you love black culture. Uh, if you, you know, you want to listen to the music, you want to emulate hairstyles, you want to dress like us, you want to put our, our fashion on the runway it all comes from somewhere and, and recognize that and embrace it and recognize the people. So one thing that came to mind when I was going through all this and, and Henry, like you were talking about Adam Silver not saying anything, the NBA, it has this image as this like super, super liberal league and it's not the NFL. But I think when you peel off the layers at times, it, it is still uh, uh, very restricted in speech but I'm happy that the players feel they have the avenue to come out and speak because you look at the rest of the leagues and there's a huge drop off from the player, the amount of players that are talking about these issues. And it's only your franchise tagged, play, you know, players. And even then it's not. So it's, I just think that it's interesting how the NBA skirts around that topic, even like with kneeling, right? You're technically not allowed. You couldn't kneel for the national anthem during an NBA game, but no one feels the pressure to do it because the NBA lets them speak out on so many other things. Yeah. And that is all for the special correspondent. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, you so idea. much. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, we're lucky to have you. Thank you for putting it all together and taking the time and trusting us and um, not making fun of my face. <laughs> this is no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hang out? Or are you gonna stay while we talk about- Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, all right, so let me introduce our guest really fast. Steve Magnus. Uh, Steve, you want to wave? Hi, Steve. Um, Steve's coached runners at every level. Um, he co-wrote with Brad the peak performance and the passion paradox. He's coached high school as professional. Four of his athletes have finished in the top 15 at the World Championships. He's served as a consultant or executive coach to high performers in a variety of business fields. Brad Solberg's essays and articles have appeared in the New York Times, Wired, New York Magazine, Forbes, Sports Illustrated, and he's a columnist for Outside Magazine. He also coaches executives, entrepreneurs, physicians, and athletes. Um, thank you for joining us. Thanks a lot for having us, Henry. Yeah, good to be here. Um, I, your books, I, I love both of your books and have noted in them and the, written about them. Um, and uh, I, there's so much in there that might apply to what's going on in the world today. But I want maybe I want to start really fast with um, uh, Marcus Thompson, um, who's a wonderful writer of The Athletic, wrote the thing recently where he quoted James Baldwin. Um, and James Baldwin, basically the same thing was happening in the 40s and James Baldwin wrote then, a complex thing can't be made simple. Deal with it in all its complexities. Um, and Marcus's kind of point is let's look all the way into the problems that are causing what's happening right now in America, not try to skirt it. And then thinking more on that, I'm like, oh, I think maybe well, I don't know what the right answer is. It seems like the wrong answer is to try to do anything fast, right? There's not going to be like, well, just blank, like is the wrong answer, right? It's going to be, it's going to be five, 10, 15, 20 years. And that made me think about you guys because you're endurance athletes yourselves who write a lot about the long game. And, and Brad, you just wrote about how um, 
endurance athletes are dealing with the pandemic a little better because some of those lessons apply. And I just thought maybe I wanted to activate that part of your brains where it's like, okay, let's talk about long-term problem solving. It's a, it's a good place to start. Um, so I think that, you know, that like what's simple is that there is just systematic oppression and racism in this country. And I think that anybody that tries to make that complex, I don't really have time for because like call a spade a spade, that's something that's happening. I think the mechanisms by which it happens are complex and are going to take time. Um, I think that like what our country needs to have, and this is a middle-class white dude that lives in Oakland, like from my perspective, we need to have like a series of family therapy sessions. And it's going to be like, um, it will be painful. We need to open up to our wounds. Like people are going to feel guilt. Um, there's going to be anger expressed. And that's the only way that we get out to the other side. Am I confident that our country can do it with our current leadership? No, not right now, um, which is really sad and, and frustrating. Um, and I think like, you know, I get back to the long game and it's funny because like you're referencing that article I wrote, but there's a part of me that's like, we don't really have time to play the long game either. Because like every additional week that we wait, like there's more injustice, there's more unrest, there's more people feeling like they're to be made irrelevant. Um, so on the one hand, like we can't be patient, but on the other hand, that James Baldwin quote, like, yeah, the shit that's happening is simple because it's wrong, but the causes are going to take some time to, to unwind. Um, so, you know, it's like another way to think of it. And then I'll turn it over to Steve is it's like, we got to think of this as a nine inning game. And right now, maybe we're only in the second inning and the second innings are really important inning. So it's not to say like lay off the second inning, you give the second inning your all. But then after the second inning, like you go home, you sleep, and then you wake up and you're just in the top of the third a month from now. Yeah, those are some really good points, Brad. Um, you know, the only thing I'd add is that like, it seems like we haven't, like the problem is like, as Brad said, relatively simple, but there's all this complex nuance around it, right? And we haven't even gotten or laid the foundation for like getting to the complexity in my, my mind. I mean, you look at some of the issues and it's, it's like we haven't even given or allowed people to satisfy their basic psychological needs, right? We're not allowing people to have that like psychological safety so that they can like express who they are like we just talked about. We're, we don't have people who feel like they're a part of a community and like they belong to the greater community, right? And when you don't have those things, like it's hard to like get to that next step. So I think it's like, you know, in my mind, we're playing with this, like there's simplicity to it, there's complexity to it, but like in order to move to the deep roots and deep understanding to address something like this, we have to like, make sure that the foundation is there to be like, you know what, we've got to satisfy like everybody's basic needs. Yeah. And, and the only thing that, again, I, you know, that I would add there in, um, I highly recommend everybody read, um, Ibram Kendi's book, how to be an anti-racist, because I think, you know, putting on like, you know, my, my white middle-class guy perspective, um, there are like, there's a difference between being a racist and a racist act. And a lot of things that have been happening, maybe like racist acts. And I think if you, if you frame it that way, um, then you give people the opportunity to grow. Like the, the example that, that comes to my mind is um, I've got a good friend here named Mimi and she's a person of color. And she's telling me like one of the worst things that, that she worries about for her sons is yeah, the police violence and all that, but also just walking down the street. And this is, I live in Oakland. Oakland's a very diverse place where people get along, huge African-American community. Um, walking down the street, just people look away from her son because he's like a larger 10 year old black dude. And my guess is some of those people are downright racist, but others are probably good people. And they, like, they're not, they don't think that they're racist, but it's just this like deep bias in the culture. And that's the stuff that we need to call out, take time to unwind and, and really discuss. Like if you've ever been walking down the street and seen a big black dude in a hoodie and kind of look down or look the other way, um, are you a racist? I'm not sure. Is that a racist act? Yes. And I think until we get to that level of nuance and complexity, um, we got a long way to go. 
Yeah, I wanted, I told this to Henry the other day, just your point there, Brad. Uh, I had a, a very small incident on Sunday and, I, and I'm, I'm talking about this regarding how we come to some solutions. Uh, and I had some pro guys come to the gym I use on Sunday and there's, on Sundays they lock it, but it's only a four foot fence around the gym. So these guys jump over it like it's a hurdle. I maneuver it, not, ele not elegantly at all, but I make it. And my son got there before Dina's me. Totally smiling at that, but yeah, it's funny. I mean, it's, a, it's a scene, man. That'd be ugly. Do your pants make it intact, David? <laughs> it's, it is a it is a scene. It's all I'm going to say. So, uh, but but so after the workout, my assistant's there, and he walks out of the gym for a minute. We're like 45 minutes in, and there's another group coming in because the guy who helps me is his, he coaches the team later on that day. And I said, "What happened?" He said, "Well, Jamaris just called. Well, Jamaris is a." Six foot eight black kid that we're in our second year of coaching, who's who's just the sweetest, nicest kid ever, and he did not want to hop the fence because there was a white woman in the playground inside the fence. Bless his heart, he he lives in a rougher area of St. Pete. He's a beautiful, intelligent young man with a loving dad, and he did the right thing. And my son never once has thought about not jumping over a fence because some lady's there. So my point is. We need to be teaching women like the woman did nothing. No one, no one, I never, I don't know who she was, but everyone needs to know if you're somewhere in the middle of the day and a black person jumps over a fence, don't immediately call the police and think something terrible is happening because you wouldn't do it if it was my son. And we have to teach that. We have, that, that is a, when you talk about long game, that's not going to be a week. That's going to take a long time to get people just to stop that initial reaction of, oh my God, something's happening because of the person's color. I couldn't agree more. And so I, I work with a lot of track athletes and distance runners, and it's really eye-opening to see the contrast of who feels comfortable in, in going for a run. Mm. So for example, you know, being a, a white male in, in Houston, which is a very diverse uh, city, very, yeah. but like I can go for a run practically anywhere in the city and not, not think about it too much, right? Some of the athletes I've worked with have, have literally been pulled over, you know, who are, who are black, who have been pulled over while they're going for a run, literally in short running shorts and a t-shirt. And in my mind that like, that blow, it, it blows me away. But like in talking with them and discussing, they're like, oh, this is like, this is something that we have to think about when it's just us and we're not part of like a larger team or group and it's different. And then you know, and like that, hearing that from several of them over the years, like it really, I, it really opens my eyes to like the different lens that I need to be able to see the world through and understand that, that like my experience is not anyone else's experience. And like, I have to understand that experience to understand, like, you know, put me in a place where I can like understand and accept and like be in a better position. We do it as husbands too. I'm sorry, Henry. We, I'm just saying we do it as husbands. We, our wives teach us. I, I don't know what it's like to be a girl. I had a, a mom and a sister. What did that tell me? No, I had to learn from my wife through her eyes what her life is like, why she doesn't go to the grocery store at night when the sun is down, and why we can't let her daughter go. I never thought about it for one second ever. I never thought about not being the first one off the elevator if I'm on with a woman and ask her what button she should press. I should just press my button and always walk out first. I, how would I know that unless someone taught me? I'm open to being taught, and that's the point. We have to be open to being taught. I'm sorry, yeah. Henry, go ahead. No, no, wait, Brad's about to talk, I think. Oh, okay. Oh, the no, mic in the ready position. no, no, I just got the mic in the ready position. I'm all, you, can, you can ask Steve. I'm always ready to talk. I was like, <laughs> I feel not ready. You know, I feel like he's a microphone checker. I'm like, damn, I need a mic. You look yeah, good. you got to get a mic. No, I just kind of, yeah. <laughs> and you hold it, you know, if you yeah. have a thought. You know, you brought up, Steve, when you mentioned the running, there's just, and there's just so many things that are intrinsic to my life. Like you said, coach, like as a woman and as a black person that I just, I don't even think about that I do anymore. So when I was training for the New York City Marathon and I had to go to a like retreat upstate New York once. And I knew that I had to get a 12 mile run in that weekend, but I didn't know where I was literally about five hours outside of New York City. So I actually researched the um, voting patterns mm -hmm. of people wow. in that area before I went and noticed wow. that they were highly Republican. And so I was already nervous in that sense. And then before I went for my run, I told two women, and this is a 
a girl thing you would do. I mean, it's the middle of the afternoon, a girl thing, but definitely a black person thing is I told them, Hey, I run about, I'm really slow. I'm, I'm sexy pace. So I was like, <laughs> I was like, I run about an 11 minute mile. I was like, if I'm not back in two and a half hours, here's my father's phone number. I was like, I straight up was like, call the authorities. And my dad's a police officer. I was like, call the authorities if I'm not back in two and a half hours. And I got like a cramp and I came back in like three hours and I yelled at them when I came back. I was like, you, you didn't check for me. And, but the fact that I have to preface my runs right. with these things is just something I'm used to. Wait, is there legit, there probably should be like an app for black runners. Like well, an app for black runners. runners right? or I know that a, a woman, she came up with, uh, you know, a, an app that will help women who want to run at night and yeah. run in secluded areas so that it, it links with like your Strava, your GPS, and you can press a button if you feel unsafe at any point in time. I'm like, I, yeah. this is a, this is a personal anxiety of mine. And but like, I run in this little town all the time. Like every run I do begins and ends with this mile through the town. And I'm on a similar schedule as a woman who I know she's a parent in the same school district. I've seen her at a million events. But when we're running, she crosses the street. Mm. And like, yeah. I totally understand why. Like, I get it. You know, David was referencing it. Like, I totally understand. But at the same time, I'm like, I don't know how to communicate to her that like, I'm here to make her feel safer, not less safe. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, she feels alone and I'm like a threat. I'm like, oh, somehow, like, let me like, I don't know if there's like a t-shirt I have to wear or a <laughs> bumper sticker I got to get or something I got to say. But like, I would like to earn her trust for it's like, no, no, no. Like I've got eyes to look out for you too. Like I'm, I'm trying to keep you safe here. And like, I feel a little bit like, I don't, it's hard to get anything I said. That's when I even, it would be super creepy. right? Like if I came up to her and we're like, Hey, I'm totally, I want to make you feel good when you run. Or <laughs> like it's all like, <laughs> <laughs> well, especially, especially now with the, with the oozing wound. Oh, it's gross. Um, so, uh, so yeah, but I do in the big picture feel the same way. I do feel the same way. Like I, like, I want Jalen Brown to feel a little like he has like one more friend than he might have known. You know what I mean? And it's no great way to say that, but like I want to. You know what I mean? Like it's sort of a. I feel like uh, actually, I have a prop for this point. This is another David Thorpe quote. Um, all right, actually, so Brad and Steve, you guys in your book says if you put inspirational like what your kind of mission is on the wall, it actually helps you get more work done. Like this is it for me. Um, Thorpe said this a long time ago. It's hard to be perfect, but it's not hard to be decent. And like, I want to be in the decency party. Like, I want to like, I want to stand for this everywhere. I feel like it solves a lot of these things we're talking about, right? Like it is, maybe it's hard to be a really good police officer right now, or maybe it's hard to be a really good protester right now and do everything right, but like, whatever. But if you're decent, like there's a bajillion of us, right? There's like, a, the whole country's for that. Yeah, just be good enough over and over again. Yeah. yeah. That's what Udonis did. He was, he was being decent when he was trying to walk that very delicate line, right? Uh, you know, Udonis knows all about the riots in Miami. That was his neighborhood and all of his friends that he played uh, basketball with growing up. Uh, so he was decent. You could, you could hear him, his, his emotion. You could see it and hear it he, that he's trying to walk that line. And, so, and just being vulnerable, which is part of being decent often, um, at least helps – you know, we, you've heard this. I don't, I'm no expert on any of this, but I guess police officers are often asked to, you know, be a settling force, whereas the Army isn't. The Army is there to kill things, kill people yeah. and blow a building. That's what the Army's supposed to do. I'm, I'm fine with that. And I'm not fine with them in, in our cities, obviously. Police are supposed to be different. They're supposed to slow things down, calm nerves. And, and so talking to you, brilliant gentlemen, uh, who understand the long haul, we have to get to find that place where how do we do that? Because I know they teach sensitivity training and racial sensitivity training in the police academies. It ain't working, right? I think we yeah. can figure it's not working. So something, talk about taking a flame. We have to blow all that up and start over with a long school process, starting, I would say, with decency. And, and then building on what we're, whatever it is that smart people talk about, I wish we could put people like Obama and a few other really brilliant people in charge of it for the next 15 years. We, but we to be fair, it didn't, it, did, it, it, 
Obama, yes, in my opinion, like is the GOAT. It, I, I'm sad to say I think he's probably going to be the best president of my lifetime, but I hope someone proves me wrong. And this stuff was happening under Obama. So like it's yeah. this is more complex than just like right. the, the leader. This is going to take uh, massive, massive culture change. Um, I saw, again, here in the Bay Area, San Francisco's mayor, London Breed, was like, you know, giving a beautiful speech. And I'm thinking, though, like, you're the mayor. Like, you, you have the most authority over the police. So um, it, it's going to be really hard. And then the other thing, Coach, that comes to mind for me, and I'm kind of um, I'm being circuitous here, is you mentioned, like, what the police are supposed to do. My guess is if you ask 99 out of 100 people to describe police, they are not going to say these are like peace officers that come keep the peace. So that also has to change because think about the people that are applying to be cops. They like are thinking like, Oh, I'm going to be a badass with a gun and I'm going to like get bad guys, which is so different than like, I'm going to be a UN peacekeeper with my, you know, yellow hat that goes into the the danger zone and says, calm down. You know, Henry, I think hit this problem on the head when he mentioned threats a little while ago. And I think like that's kind of what it comes down to to me when I'm thinking, okay, how do we how do we change the police? And Brad hinted at this, but it's the framework of like when you see others as a threat, right? Then you're more likely to quickly re- react in terms of you know spiral down. I think it is what I kind of see it as, and it's like, and even if you look at some of, I'm gonna go science nerd for a second, but like, good, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Look at some of the research, right? The the area in the brain that responds to threat, the amygdala, will light up differently for, you know, if I'm a white person looking at uh, photos of black people, like the amygdala some in some individuals and in some research will light up more, right? Because you're having this very small threat response. And like that can grow over time if you if you feed that. Or it can shrink over time if you work on it, right? If you yeah. work to get almost rewire yourself to stop seeing things as threats that aren't actually threats. And I think uh, yeah, like, that's it. Th- ahead, that CJ. is the key. So when we're looking at the police or whoever, myself even, it's like, how do you rewire yourself to not see these things as threats, but instead, you know, teammates? I mean, I, you know, uh, as I said, I grew up in Houston, which is really diverse, but like, I think what really I was fortunate to be part of is a track team growing up, which is a very diverse sport. And like you understand and you start to like become teammates and best friends with all these different people. And it like, maybe it occurs naturally, but like that threat response goes down because like, it's just me and my friend shooting the shit, you know? And I think like how to create that, that is not my expertise. But like, if I'm looking at the police and what to do, I'm saying, okay, how do we rewire this to see things not as a threat that shouldn't be a threat? I think you label it like um, police anxiety disorder, because that's what this is really about. Like, it, 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 it's anxiety. And, and there's a ton of research, thank goodness, on how to treat anxiety. It's like the gold standard treatment is called exposure and response prevention. So if you're super scared of snakes and your amygdala lights up when you see a snake, or some people are super scared of glass cups, like the brain can do all kinds of weird things. And your amygdala lights up when you see a glass cup because you think it's going to break. Please put that down, Brad, please. The way that you treat that, (laughs) and it can feel like the world's going to end for the person with the anxiety. I've had an anxiety disorder. It sucks. The way that you treat that is you expose yourself to the glass cup. You sit there and you hold the freaking cup and you let yourself be anxious over and over again. But if you have a culture that perpetuates these, um, these myths, like, well, glass cups are more dangerous than paper cups, all that stuff just adds. So it's going to, I think it will take a cultural shift. And then I think that lots of people in this country, lots of people in the police force basically have an anxiety disorder and they need to confront that anxiety disorder with evidence-based mechanisms to get over it. Um, again, like th- I, this sounds like very ivory tower idealistic, how to make that happen. I wish I had an easy answer. I don't. Um, but that's it. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you on the anxiety, the thing, like it's an actual brain function. And then I'm just going to also throw that some people are just hateful as shit, right? Like yes. I'm gonna put that in, and somehow they got a badge too, and they want to throw up uh, white power symbols and things of that sort. But cause yeah, was that NYPD cop throwing up the white power thing was the scariest yeah, thing I've seen. I saw, I saw that because, and, and I say the anxiety thing exists or, um, or hate is, is bred, especially because 
uh, that I think Judy put up the use of force project, uh, you'll have black officers who respond, their amygdala lights up the same as a white officer. And they're, so they're literally scared of themselves. And that is an anxiety uh, approach because of what they've seen and in the field right or what they've learned growing up but some people literally got a badge so that they could uh, cleanse i guess if i would say oh god that's terrible i don't i don't know how to work like okay i also feel like there's in there's been racism in america you know baked in from the start as we talked about on this show also on top of that right now there's this like you know internet-based organized stoking of like like that little symbol that that cop threw up is like not a coincidence right there are places these conversations are happening and um and somehow in a ways that i don't totally understand um like i was talking to david and i were talking all this morning about um like there was a little while where like all these english teenagers were going to join isis right and it's like well, what's happening there it's like well something's wrong in england right like they don't feel enough hope and joy and and, and potential for themselves following the path that's before them if they stay on course in England, right? So this is a chance to feel powerful, right? This radicalization comes with like this notion that you're now you're gonna, life is gonna be vital and more exciting and there's more sex and drama and all this stuff, right? And, um, and you know, that's not like thousands went, but hundreds did. Um, I feel like there's a little bit of this happening with all parties here too, right? Where like hundreds of millions of Americans don't feel like the path in front of them is, full of enough potential for like happiness and joy. And, you know, like I, I you know, we have a house and children and I have a happy marriage and I, I feel like, okay, you know, we're, we're probably gonna work this out one way or another, right? Despite the coronavirus and whatever. But, um, but I think most Americans don't feel that way, right? So now there's like this uh, desperation and fear, which gets that amygdala going and then maybe there's a potential to blame. And, and suddenly there's like this, uh, you know, on top of whatever's been going on right now, there's this like fuel on the fire, which is like, let's organize and get ourselves some more power, right? And some of those people will become police officers and some of those people are, you know, trying to solve the problem of their own lives with this abuse of power. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. You know, I think it comes down to like, I mentioned earlier, like one of our basic needs is the ability to feel like we can make progress at something right to like achieve some sort of competency to achieve some sort of mastery to progress in life and um we've done a really shitty job as a society of giving people a path to that and i think it's as simple as that like if you don't have a path if you don't have that ability to make progress like what do we think's gonna happen right like you take that need away and like it makes sense that there's protests and like all of this stuff and, and, and I think like it gets back to playing the short game and the long game. So the short game is like, stop what's happening now, like put the freaking fire out and then worry about what started the fire. So you don't get the next one or maybe do it both at the same time. Um, but like most people that are bullies are just insecure. Like that's it. So like, all these, I can't help but think, um, like there's this beautiful line in a song. I, there's an artist named Nako and Medicine for the People. And he's got like so many good songs. Um, but there's one line and I hope it's from him. Now I'm thinking, is it from him? He basically says like conceal and carry your fear. And like, mm. that's what it's about. Like if you feel the need to be walking around with like a big old gun intimidating people, you're just like scared. And like, you're like a wuss. I hate to say it. Like that's not tough at all. Um, and I think that like, there's a lot of insecurity. And again, I don't, I don't necessarily, I wish I knew how to fix it, but I have no idea. Like, I don't know how I think Steve's right. I think like giving, giving opportunity to people. Um, and then like, you know, this is going to sound Pollyanna, but I think it's real. Like we need like more loving policies and like a more loving government. And we need to be electing leaders and putting policies in place that are like more compassionate. Um, and that's what it's going to take. But that's, again, that's the long haul back to like what Adina said, right. you know, if I'm not like the 34 year old, that's a white supremacist right now. Like, I don't want that person on the street, period. Maybe that maybe, we'll, maybe you work on his kids and maybe, maybe you reform him in, in prison. That'd be great. Like we need more of that. But I think like we kind of have to play these, you know, back to the initial prompt, we got to play these two paths at the same time. So one is like, put the fire out right now, make people feel safe right now. Don't be patient. 
And then the other is address these underlying causes in a way that is going to take some time. Well, Steve, you train athletes. I'm curious if you come across what I do, uh, which I think is appropriate to this discussion. It, you, you, we hear the, the comment in basketball anyway, always oh, got great instincts or great feel. And people think that instincts are, are things you're born with, which they are. That's when you're born. As you grow up, you realize don't put your hand in boiling water, right? Don't try to jump off a cliff and think you'll, you have to learn those things and parents teach you. As a coach, very rarely have I gotten a player at the pro level, especially, that had had everything, did, did everything right already. LeBron James' instincts are immaculate. He is not the same player he was when he was 18. I watched him play then too, okay? We're teaching all the time instinct. React immediately when you see this, which is not what you've been doing, which is why you keep turning the damn ball over. <laughs> We're teaching those instincts. We can do the same thing with our officers as well as with citizens in general, that this is how you should be reacting immediately, instinctively. We just have to change those instincts. But you're teaching running. Are you finding similar things with runners? A hundred percent. I mean, I think that's basic coaching. Like that yeah. it applies to anything you do. Um, and I think that's a good point. I mean, I, I, I think that like somehow we have to get to a way and we'll use police's example that like you're changing their natural in, or their instincts for people who are doing it the wrong way. Right. And it's, yeah. it shouldn't like, it's not this big thing that we don't know how to do. Right. You just mentioned in basketball, like you do it all the time, like in running, we do it all the time. Like running is essentially, especially distance running. It's like learning not to listen to the instinct to quit and exactly. give up. Exactly. And, and like, right. Listen to this other voice and this other instinct over here. And like, and you've trained. Me, it, exactly. You train it. And like, to me, it seems like a no brainer of like, okay, like, get the best people, all the science, get some coaches involved and like figure out how to create this and train officers in this way because like we do it all the time in sports. But that's where policy comes in too because if you want to if you want to train a runner not to have the instinct to give up, you don't have them run in pajamas while listening to lullaby music. So if we outfit the police, so we should the, try wait, wait, that. Wait. That sounds kind of fun. If we outfit the police, if we outfit police with freaking military gear, yeah, they're gonna act like they're in a freaking military. Great point. Like you know, I mean, so so I think that again, like I'm because I'm it's in my brain and again, I'm no expert on this. Like it's like what are the actual policies that will that will start pushing the needle? And there's one that just seems like like again, we said this is complex, but that seems kind of simple, mm -hmm. like. You know, if, 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 if you're going to make someone feel like a soldier, they're going to be more likely to act like a soldier. Here's there, a simple policy. If you kill someone as a cop, you're going to jail for a long time. That's a good idea. Right. That's I a good one. Think, though, <laughs> like, it's super, I think we just, as part, part of your family counseling, but I think that, like, those cops dress like that because they're really scared. And, mm -hmm. like, you know, like, until they're unscared, they're going to want more armor and bigger more guns. Protection. And, like, yeah. I, I don't know what we do about that, but, like, I don't think we can tell them not to be scared and have that work. Like, I think they have to, like, like, you know, anyways, I, there was a big New Yorker story about how criminals got bigger guns. And that's when, that's when wow. police forces ramped up. But we're almost out of time. Gerard Hector yeah. ends the show with the best question of the day, which is about to come in three, two, one. <laughs> I don't know if it's the best question, but I, you know, I wanted to follow up on something you said, Henry, about cops and these bigger guns. Like, I live in New York City. Obviously, you guys are in Oakland and various places. I don't know about you, but when I see at the subways, police in military gear with automatic assault rifles, I don't feel safer. It doesn't make me feel like, oh good, someone's here to protect me today. I'm like, holy hell, somebody's gonna get killed. Like, because all it needs is one thing to pop off and that thing comes out and you're all familiar with guns, like automatic, there's just bullets flying everywhere. But we talked about how many things are uh, so complex and so difficult to solve how much of this is just really back to some simple basics and coach always talks about decency but when we talk about people who are willing to help in this cause you know adina like we've been saying you've been your foot's been on our neck for 400 years so if we want things to change again it's people like henry like coach like you all white people who are willing to stand up and put things on the line right you have to be willing to risk friendships risk social status, risk all sorts of things that then will make life better for everyone. And do we have enough people willing to do that? And are people even in their mind, as much as they say they want to, are they capable of mentally getting to a place where they say, yep, 
I'm willing to risk those things for these people who I don't know. We got to teach our kids that too. I had a talk with my son about that today. I'll talk to my daughter later. Exactly at this point, uh, what you just said, we have, we have to be willing to, uh, to risk that. I just come back to Ibram Kendi's book. I mentioned it earlier because it's been eye-opening for me. Like, you know, not being racist isn't enough. You need to be an anti-racist. Yeah. I think everyone should read that book right now. And I think if you're a white person and that book makes you uncomfortable, that's the point. It's, yeah. it's, it's a great book. It's in Friday's liner notes. There's a, I, I right. brought out a book for people to read. It's in there. <laughs> All right. Who wants the last word? We have like a minute left, I think. Um, not me. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Uh, Adina, I see you, queen. Nice shirt. Adina wants to do this. Yes, yeah. queen. Yes, Here's queen. my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> listen next next show i'm 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 gonna give me a mic though but this was great i i maybe i'll have the last word i always feel smarter uh after this thank you so much for everyone's input and this stuff is hard to talk about i did a podcast uh, uh last week and i teared up after it and at times i can feel like this is performative it's black sometimes it's black pain like look at how much i've been discriminated against but i don't feel that here i feel smarter and i always feel like i have something to walk away with to do after this oh thank you thank and you adored. and adored adina we're lucky we're, we're lucky that you trust us and visit us yes. and make us smarter thank no you much be safe guys thank you so much all right everyone take Bye. care thank you Bye.